When we have an experience with God, it's not just a, one event that takes place in our life, but God wants to do more and more and more and more abundantly above all we might ask or even think. And no matter how long it takes God to deliver, He will come through. God will come through no matter the timeline, no matter how long it takes. It's not just coming into the church and coming into these four walls where we shall expect great expectations and great moves of God, but it's in our everyday life. We should wake up wanting God to do something we've never seen before. remain standing today my message is great expectation and it's with great expectation we expect that God has delivered it's with great expectation we know that God has already set free healed and delivered your situation that you think was dead God has already set it forth in his word that great it, sh it shall be done it shall be done it shall be done let everybody say it shall be done it shall be done Isaiah 9 verse 6, uh, you may remain standing for the reading of the word. I just wanted to introduce, um, I just wanted to, you know, with respect, and I want to observe protocol first, greetings to pastor, greetings to all the ministers, the newly ordained ministers and, and elders, and to all you wonderful saints in the name of Jesus, to my mother that's not here, and to, to every, each and every one of you, I love you with the love of Christ. And I'm not saying that, I mean it from the bottom of my heart. I love each and every one of you. And for those that are viewing online, God bless you. And I hope that today's message might speak to you in a special way um, that you might understand that God is your healer and deliverer. And it's with great, great expectation we tap into the move of God. We tap into what God is doing. So Isaiah 9 verse 6 says, unto us a child is born. Let's say it together. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. The next verse, Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. And this says, let's say it together. Now the birth of Christ, Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Can we say found with child of the Holy Ghost together? Found with child of the Holy Ghost. You may be seated. Hallelujah. This message here, you usually hear this on Christmas Day, but today... I just feel in my spirit that we really need to hear this again from a different perspective, from a different lens. I believe that the child Jesus Christ that was, that was put forth into this world, sent by God, was designed for us to have redemption, for us to, to really understand what God is, was going to do. And it's for our salvation. And I really love how Isaiah said it. And Isaiah had no idea what was going on, but... He saw through the lens of the eyes of God that a child would be born. His name would be wonderful. His name would be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. It's with great expectations we tap into what God is doing. And it's with great expectation we know that God is up to something good. And it's not until we have this expectation that we're able to really understand what God is doing. And usually when we come to church, we, we, we just come not expecting. But can you imagine if we had the anticipation coming into his presence, knowing that he's going to do something great, knowing that he's going to heal somebody, knowing that he's going to set someone free. It's with that expectation we need to come into the presence of God and to really understand. But I'm going to take a step back because I'm going to challenge you. It's not just coming into the church and coming into these four walls where we shall expect great expectations and great moves of God. But it's in our everyday life. We should wake up wanting God to do something we've never seen before. 
Hallelujah. I believe when, when, when God was speaking to, to one of the prophets, I, I forgot his name, but he said, um, enlarge my territory that, that, that I, I might be able to do your works. It, and that individual is not just talking about financial increase, and I believe that God will bless you financially, but he's talking about a move of God in a special way that money can't even hold it. That money can't even hold it. And I believe that when we move into God and we, we expect God to move, it's an indication that we've prepared ourselves for supernatural blessing, for something supernatural. And supernatural is defined by, by something that we've never experienced before. It's, it's a miraculous move. It's something that, that can't really be understood. The word super and natural, so natural is something that we understand, but supernatural is something we don't understand. So when somebody is in the hospital and sick, and, and the doctor says, it's going to take time for you to heal, and it's going to take you years and years to heal, hallelujah, the supernatural says, and the supernatural acts through time, and he doesn't need you to, 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 to wait two years for you to get your healing. He can heal you right now. There's no time limit for God. There's no time limit for God. And Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, without faith, it is impossible. It is impossible to please him, for he cometh, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he, that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Yes. Now, when we talk about uh, the encounter with Mary, Mary was given a prophecy, where Mary was given a prophecy of something that was in her womb. And it was the sixth month that the angel Gabriel had spoken to her. And she, and she was in, the, in Nazareth at this time. And I'm reading from Luke 1, verse 26. And she was a virgin, and she was espoused to, to Joseph. And Joseph was of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Verse 28 says, And the angel came unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored, highly favored, and the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And verse 29 says, and when she saw him, she was troubled. She was scared. She was not in the sense of afraid and, and of, of her life, but she saw something amazing. I believe when God is revealing his self to you and his angel is appearing to you, he's not coming to make you scared. He's not coming to, to make you run away, but he's coming to show himself. And she, um, and here we see, we see in verse 29, it says, and when she saw saw him, she was troubled at the saying, and cast in her mind, what manner of salvation is this? And verse 30 says, and the angel said unto her, thou, uh, said unto her, fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Verse 31, and behold, thou hast conceived in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. And this is the prophecy that she was given. And it's amazing what God is doing in the life of Mary. And Mary here, she's get, getting this, this indication and she's getting this, this prophecy that's received to her. But with this prophecy, she, I'm sure she, she's excited. She's excited knowing that God is doing something special in our lives. And God has planted a seed and a gift within every one of us under the sound of my voice. And he's expecting something to take place in your life. He's expecting that seed of promise, that seed of faith to grow. And it's up to us to respond to what God is doing in our life. Because if we don't respond to the call of God, we might potentially miss forfeit or miscarriage that seed that God has within us. And God is looking for us to participate in this expectation and this wonderful seed that he's taking, that's taking place in our lives. And we all have a purpose and a plan that God is really trying to do within our lives. And the plan of God is literally God's will. But there's a struggle when God has implanted a seed, when has, he has planted a gift in our spirit. And the problem is two things, and you, you probably know this. It's, it's two wills that are battling, just like how uh, Rebecca, she was pregnant with Esau and Jacob. There was a struggle within her spirit she was in her womb, and there was a struggle. And just like in our lives, there's a struggle between two wills, and that will is the will of our flesh and the will of God. And the will of God cannot, cannot, cannot 
if we don't submit to the plan of God, it's impossible for God to work in our lives. But it's through, through true submission is when God decides to work. Just like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was praying and he, he was about to go to Calvary and go to glory and show his power and what was going to be happening on that cross. But he said in the Garden, nevertheless, not my will, not my will, but thine be done. Meaning that he could have rejected the will of the Father. He could have, but that wasn't in his purpose. That wasn't in his plan. And that wasn't in the plan of God. And just like how God has a plan for us, we need to operate in the plan that God has for us. Amen. So it's through this development where we realize that, that God, it's through this development that we need to have an expectation and understand that God is doing something special. And it starts with this little seed. And as the seed grows and becomes into something beautiful, and we're, we're not waiting for this to take place and that's it. It's not, I'm not talking about an event in our life because when Mary had given birth to Jesus Christ, she could have said after the birth, you know, that's it. That, that's all that happened. But she actually nursed the child and Jesus Christ while he was a baby. Jesus didn't feed himself. If Jesus was able to cry, while he, was, while he was on this earth, if he felt the emotions while we were on this earth through the flesh, we know that as a child, he did child things. And it's important to realize that when we have an experience with God, it's not just a, one event that takes place in our life, but God wants to do more and more and more and more abundantly above all we might ask or even think. So never ever put God and place God on just uh, an event and equal him, him to his, his power to an event. That's not what God is, is, wants to do, do in your life. He wants to do exceedingly abundantly uh, more and more and more. And it's important to realize that, that Mary, in her actual, in her actual um, when she was born, Mary was a young, a young woman at that time. And, and it suggests through Jewish um, through Jewish studies, that she was around the age of 14. She was a very young, young girl. And it's crazy to understand that when Mary was born and when, when Jesus was born, Mary, through Jewish tradition and Jewish culture, Mary would have been socially ostracized because of this, this birth, miraculous birth. She would have been embarrassed because she was pregnant before she was married. She was in, espoused to Joseph. And the engagement is just as important as the marriage. The engagement was just important as living a life together, both husband and wife. When she was found pregnant by the Holy Ghost, she was at risk, high risk. That's why the, the Bible here says that in, in Matthew 9, 1, chapter 119, when Joseph, when, then Joseph, her husband, being just a man, and not willing to take to make her a public make her a public example was minded to put her away privately so joseph a just man realized that this was something that god was doing and he wanted to preserve what god had already had planned because of the angel that had came to joseph and it's so important that when god births a purpose it calls for separation it calls for being alone. When God births a purpose in your life and a plan, it calls for isolation. It, ca it causes you to really realize and to really gain your strength from the Lord rather than your strength in other things. And in her, in her vulnerability, God had just preserved her. God had just placed a covering over her, and he's doing a work in our lives. I was at a, a baby shower just the other day, and I learned a lot. I learned a lot because we did some activities, and the activities that we did were, were we were talking about different cravings that, uh, you know, a woman would get through pregnancy and how she wouldn't want it, different things. And I just want to get your participation, and I just want to, all the women that have, you know, given birth, that have, have a child, I want you to raise your hand. All the mothers, all the mothers. Okay, so I want you to tell me, okay, I need your help here because I'm clearly not married and I clearly haven't gone through this. What were some of the 
the cravings that you had. Chinese, I heard Chinese food. I heard salt, shrimp, tamarind. Okay, whatever that is. What what else? Cream pan? Green mango. Green mango. Okay, okay. Any anyone else? Eggs. Banana. Red banana. See, 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 when, when a woman is going through this, this transition, there's cravings. There's also dislikes. And if you are craving a lot of unhealthy foods, such as sweets, chocolates, and, and, and if you overindulge with these things, it will add too much sugar as well as provide, will, will <laughs> cause over excess weight <laughs> and even dental problems. But I'm so glad that when we crave for the things of God, when we crave for his presence, and when we crave for something extraordinary in our life, we don't have to be worried about being overweight. We don't have to be worried about dental problems. We don't have to be worried in overindulging in the things of God. Because when there's an expectation, and the thing about this is, it's not just women that can crave the things of God, it's also men too. Men can crave the things of God. And there's always an expectation when you have the cravings of, of what God is doing for you. And he's working on us every single day. And when we have the cravings of God, his desires become our desires. Your love being, being in his, your, your love and being in his presence just soothes you. And you want to experience that on an ongoing basis. And worship becomes a, like a lifestyle rather than just an event. Because when we're gathered together here on a Sunday morning, it's an event. It's scheduled. We know that church starts at 11 o'clock. Some people show up at 11.15. Some people show up at 11.20. Some people show up at 12 o'clock. Some people show up at 10.15. But we know that it's an event. But God is looking for a worship that goes beyond just an event. A worship that, that exalts who he is on an ongoing basis. And we need to also realize that lack of satisfaction with these things of the world is something that, that we start to separate ourselves with when we desire the things of God. Because when we desire the things of God, we start choosing our friends very carefully. We start choosing our association very carefully. The places we go, we don't go no more because the craving we have is so strong that it creates a separation that I don't go to these places anymore because my cravings, hallelujah, my cravings has, has changed. There was, I, I couldn't tell you when the craving started, how it began, just like a child, when, when the child is being, I don't know when the arms and the legs have formed, but when God has placed a special anointing on you and a calling, there's something that just shifts in your spirit, and you know it's of God, you know, and because of that, you just know that you have to be different. You, you are set apart. And just like David in, in, the 30, in the 63rd Psalms, he said, O oh God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee, in a, thirst, thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. Hallelujah. To see thy power and thy glory. So as I have seen thee, in the sanctuary, because thy loving kindness is better. Thy loving kindness is better, better than life. My lips shall praise thee. That's the craving I'm talking about. That's the craving that David is talking about. My, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee I, while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. This is the craving I'm talking about. Philippians 3 verse 10. This is Paul speaking now of the craving. Hallelujah. He says that I may know him. 
Hallelujah. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I may obtain unto the resurrection of the dead. And here's Jesus says in Matthew 5, verse 6, Blessed are ye which hunger, hallelujah, and thirst after righteousness, for you shall, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are you that hunger and thirst after righteousness. This is the craving that Jesus is talking about. We should crave righteousness. We should just want righteousness all the time. And it's interesting here because you cannot be blessed without having a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. Because here it says, blessed are they that which hunger, which hunger and thirst after righteousness. And Psalms here says, blessed is the man that walketh not. Into the, in, in, in the counsel of the godly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Now here's the craving that David is talking about in verse, in verse 2. He's saying, but his delight. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. He's always thinking about the craving. The craving, he's always wanting more. There's nothing that can satisfy David. And here in verse 3, it says, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water and that bringeth forth fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither. And whatsoever whatsoever you touch, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus, it shall prosper because you are blessed. Whatsoever you do shall prosper. And the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the, the wind driveth away. Hallelujah. And the next verse says, therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor singers in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, and the way of the ungodly shall perish. Hallelujah. I'm so glad that because I'm serving Jesus, I'm so glad that because I have the craving for the righteousness, I shall not perish. Hallelujah. I shall not perish because I have the craving that Jesus is talking about here. And I know that I have better days ahead because I crave righteousness. I crave the things of God. And I shall not perish. And whatever I shall touch shall prosper. Whatever I shall touch shall prosper. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Whatever I shall touch shall prosper in the name of Jesus Christ. Because I know that through, hallelujah, through Jesus, whatever I touch shall prosper. Thank you, Jesus. And this is what, this is, what is happening in Mary's life. You know, and this is why it's so important for us to realize that we need to be in an environment that is conducive to what God is doing in our life. If the environment doesn't produce and over and help us to plant what God's doing, we're not in his will. We're not doing what God has required of us. And we need to really understand that, that it's, in, it's important for us to be empowered. And you need people that will empower you. Because it's so important that you, you hang around individuals and you surround yourself with people that will lift you up. I heard a saying the other day in, in business, your, your net worth is equal to your, your net worth is equal to your network. Meaning that if you hang around people that are broke, you're going to have the broke mentality. They don't, if you gave a million dollars to someone that was broke, they would blow it away. This is why these NBA players, they get millions of dollars of contracts, and 12 years down the road after their contract, they're bums on the street, forgive my language, because they don't understand how to invest their money. They don't understand, they're not surrounded with people that can, that can show them this is what you need to do. 
And I just want to be very transparent. In Ryerson, when I was going through school, and this is a message for the, those that are challenged at work or even at school, or looking to, to, to get the blessings of God in a unique way, it's so important for us in the secular world to, to surround ourselves with people that will even build us up. I'm not even talking about spiritual side now. I'm talking about natural side. Because God has given wisdom to those that are not in these four walls. And it's important for us to use their knowledge for us to give God the glory. And when I was in university, I wasn't the smartest person. But I passed, and I did well. And that was because I, when I had trouble in university, pre, before, my evil, before my test, before my exam, before anything, I made sure that I studied with the best. I made sure I was around the best because I knew that if I was around these guys that were getting A's, that were getting A pluses, I knew that this would elevate my game. This would elevate my game. This would take me to another level. So if you're at work, hang around the best people that are best performers. If you're, if you're, if you're, if you're, at, if you're at home, make sure you're you, you understand this principle to always connect with people that are better with you and better than you. And this is so important for us to realize that when we surround ourselves with these people, don't think of it as a, a negative thing like putting yourself down or anything like that. Because what you're actually doing, you're helping yourself. You're developing yourself. And you're surrounding yourself. And just like the natural, same with the spiritual. If you feel lonely, if you feel down spiritually, connect with someone that's always going to encourage you. Connect with someone that says, just push a little longer. Just go the extra mile. Don't worry, it's going to get better. You need to be around those people. And just like Mary, Mary hastens to Elizabeth, and she goes to Zacharias' house, and she's rushing, and she's just looking to find a way to get and share the good news. And as she goes to this house, and she, she's explaining what God had done in her life, and it's so important to have someone that is on the same wavelength as you in the spirit. Because here we see Elizabeth, when she hears the salvation, the babe in Elizabeth's room, which was John, had leaped. And there was an electric spiritual shock that had happened because in her spirit, she connected. And this is why we must be filled with the Holy Ghost and we must be connected with people. And just so you know, I'm not saying that if you're not filled with the Holy Ghost, you can't be connected because you can still be connected with someone that may not have the Holy Ghost. But if you do have the Holy Ghost and someone doesn't have the Holy Ghost, they will know that they need to get something special in their life. And their spirit will leap. And this is what we see in the actual scriptures. And Mary is, is now connected to Elizabeth and the babe has leaped inside of her and, and she spake out loud with a loud voice saying, Blessed, blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Verse, Luke 1 verse 43. And hence is this to me that the mother of my Lord shall come unto me. For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salvation sounded in my ear, the babe left, leapt in my womb for joy. Verse 45 says, and blessed is she that believeth, and there shall be a performance for those things which were told of her. And this is told of the Lord, told her from the Lord. And this is so important. And this is what happens when you're connected with someone on the, on, the, on the right level. When you're connected with someone that can build you up. And Mary then creates, creates a song unto the Lord. Now, I don't know what key Mary was singing in. I don't know if she was musical. And if you are creating a song to the Lord in your room, wherever you are, in your car, you don't need any music. You don't need any singers. You don't even need to be on key. But if you are raising your voice to the Lord in great expectation of what he's doing, you can just lift up your voice and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for what you're doing and what you're about to do in my life and what you're doing. And it's so important that when we connect with people, we create a strong bond in the spirit. Because in Deuteronomy 32 verse 20 says, if it says that people... how." 
how could one chase a thousand of them and two people put 10,000 to flight unless the rock be sold, sold them? And this is, this is what Deuteronomy is saying, that, that one can put a thousand to flight, but two can put 10,000 to flight. This is why I don't understand why people don't want to come to church because this is just an example of two people together. But I'm looking here under the sound of my voice. There's people online, probably 30 people watching. And I'm looking here and there's about 75 people here. So this is something that we need to understand because even though this is 10,000 for two people, this is an exponential logar logarithmic equation that we actually did on a Friday night. We actually put together an equation here and we said that if all of these people just agree and just touch and agree, your problems, your situations, everything that you're going through, that you're having trouble with, can be put to flight. Can be put to flight because we touch and agree. And again, I say, not say unto you, if two of you shall agree on earth, as touching anything that they, that, that they shall ask, it shall be done of the Father which is in heaven. In Matthew 18, 20 says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, where just two, two or three are gathered together in, in my name, that's, 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 all he, that's all he needs. He, and then he says, there I am in the midst of them. There I am in the midst of them. And this pregnancy that's taking place in, in Mary's life, the devil, the devil always just tries to destroy the plan of God. Because he, he, he knows the plan is working, but he may not know exactly what is going on. Because the scripture has said if he had known that Jesus had been re resurrected, which means that he had no idea. But here we see Herod wanting to act like he wants to worship Jesus. Talking to the wise men and saying, show me where he is that I may, may worship him. That's in a deception from the enemy. And there's many people in our circle that we need to understand and try the spirit of. There's certain people on this girl that, that are not there to be fertile in what God is doing in our life. And it's so important to realize this because those people, and it's not the person, it's the spirit within the person. So don't get mad at the person. It's the spirit and that's the adversary. And the devil is working so hard to abort and to create a, a spiritual miscarriage. And here we see that, that this is something that we see in Scripture all the time. But I want to ask you, who told you that when God gave birth to this plan, you wouldn't have haters? You wouldn't have people that would hate you because you have something being birthed inside of you? Who told you that, you know, there would be no persecution? Who told you you wouldn't lose your job? Who told you that there would be no separation. There would be no isolation. We come with, it's important for us to, to separate ourselves. And we see this with Joseph. We see this with Moses. We see this with Elijah the prophet. We see this with Rahab. We see this with Daniel. We see this constantly, constantly in scripture. But it's important for us to realize that, that the miraculous move of God is so important for us to tap into. And uh, Simeon was a man of God, and he was, was expecting the, the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him, and he was waiting for the birth of Jesus Christ. And when he had the baby in Luke verse 12, 2 verse 26 and it was revealed and it was revealed unto him by the holy ghost that he that he should not see death before he had seen the lord's christ meaning 
he wasn't supposed to die until he saw Jesus. And he was with great expectation waiting for this day. Just waiting, waiting, waiting. Because he knew that the word had spoken in his life that he should not die until he's seen the Christ. And verse 27 said, it says, And he came by the Spirit onto the temple. And when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. My eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, and light, and, light, and light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And this is the thing, because when this child was born, this was the eighth day, because the eighth day was when the, the, the male child would have been blessed and circumcised. So this is so important to realize, because when we see the prophecy that was given to Mary, the prophecy that was given to, to Joseph, they understand what was going on. But in verse 20, 33, it gives us an idea of how they were still marveled at what was spoken. Because they, they, it seemed like something had happened between those eight days. And it's so important for us to realize that it's not necessarily about the event, but it's about what God is carrying in our lives. And here we see that, that Jesus... And, and the family goes to Jerusalem every year. They go to Jerusalem every year to partake in Passover. And this is when Jesus was about 12 years old. And when they went to Passover, they, they did what they needed to do. They spent a day traveling. I want, I want to say it's more than a day because it takes 12, 24 hours to actually get from Nazareth to Jerusalem by walking. If you're driving a car, it takes you an hour and 44 minutes. They didn't have a car. And they were walking with a bunch of people, like a company of people. And because of that, the travel that took 29 hours must have took longer. The reason being is because Jesus as a child is going to Passover with the family. Jesus is not the only child going to Passover with his family. There's other people. They're probably lagging and logging, like, you know, Mom, I'm tired. It's just, we have to go to Passover again every year. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my gosh. The walk is so far. It's a three days journey. But they dragged them to the Passover. It was something that was needed for them to go. I'm not saying that was Jesus' attitude, but I'm saying that's probably what the attitude was of the other kids. Oh, why do I got to go to church? Oh, my gosh. And another Sunday? So we see that this, this has happened. And now when they're done Passover, they're traveling back to Nazareth. They take a day's journey. But as they take this day journey, Mo, uh, Joseph and Mary are looking around through the people. And they realize they don't have Jesus with him, with them. And they're looking and like, where is Jesus? They go back to Jerusalem. And when they go back to Jerusalem, they're looking for Jesus. The first day, they don't find him. They're asking people. They're knocking on doors. They're going there where they were to see where Jesus was. They can't find Jesus. Second day, asking people, probably asking the same person, do you see him yet? No, we didn't see Jesus. Jesus is not around here. And on the third day, they found him. And this is when Jesus is 12. And, verse, and Luke 20, verse 42. 49 says, and he said unto them, how is it that ye sought me whilst ye not, let me read that again, wits ye not that I must be about my father's business? And verse 50 says, and they understood not which he spake unto them. Let's pause there. At age of 12, Jesus has been circumcised, he's passed three past seven, now he's at the age of 12. And here we see in scripture that they still don't understand what he's saying. That is mind-boggling, knowing that they've had a prophecy, they've understood, 
They clearly didn't understood, but they were given a, a prophecy of what Jesus is going to do, and they still didn't understand what Jesus is saying. And verse 51 says, And he went down from them and came to Nazareth and was subject, and, and was subject unto them, but his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. Thank God for a mother. She kept all of these sayings in her heart. We see the eighth day of circumcision. They're marveled. Jesus is now 12. And as he's 12, they still don't understand. But her mother keeps these things in her heart. I can just imagine Mary, when Jesus is 15, when are these things going to be? When is God going to appear and show himself like I was promised? Jesus turns 17. Still the same thing. They go to Passover. They come back. Jesus is still a carpenter, being trained by his father. Nothing's changed. Age 22, nothing's changed. Hallelujah. Nothing's changed. And Mary's just, Mary's just waiting for the promise. Mary's waiting for the performance to take place. But nothing is happening. She's wait, I believe she's waiting in great expectation. Wanting this prophecy to take place. And no matter how long it takes God to deliver, he will come through. God will come through no matter the timeline no matter how long it takes. But let me submit to you that this took 30 years for Mary to actually see the manifestation of God, to actually see things happen. And it's so important for us to realize that after this event that takes place in our lives and what happens in our life, let's not just get connected to an event. Let's not just get, get connected to a circumstance or God doing something. God is going to do a thing, a, a new, 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 every single day. He said, I will do a new thing. And that's what God is, is, is going to be doing in our lives. And it might take 30 years for us to see the manifestation of what God has actually promised us. Hallelujah. But it's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth the wait. It's going to be worth the isolation. It's going to be worth still having the cravings of God. It's going to be worth continuing that desire of those cravings of, those, of the things of God. It's still going to be worth it. But here we see in John 2 verse 1, there was a special marriage, a marriage ceremony that took place. And this is what took place, where God was going to perform. And there was no wine left. I don't know if the person planned poor planning. I don't know if there was more people that came than expected up the streets. But all I know is that they ran out of wine. And basically, verse 2, verse 4 says, Jesus said unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour has not come. And verse 5 said, His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, just do it. Don't, just, just do it. No, don't ask no questions. Don't, don't rebuttal. Don't let there be any unbelief. Just do it. It's so important for us to realize that when God says something, just do it. Do it and believe. Because we see that even though Elizabeth was birth of child, Zacharias did not believe what was going to happen. And because of his unbelief, God shut his mouth until the birth of actual John. And we see that they were trying to name the baby Zacharias. They were trying to name the baby after his father. But Zacharias could not even talk. He was like, mm, mm, mm. Mean, he was trying to communicate, no, no, that's not so, because he got the prophecy. Yeah. 
but he couldn't talk because of his unbelief. And they gave him a piece of paper and said, what are you trying to say? As they gave him the paper, he wrote down his name is John. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that goes to say that don't let God put us in a position because of our unbelief. Don't let God do something that he doesn't have to do because of your unbelief. But let God work and let God do what he needs to do. And here we see that, that Jesus is performing his first miracle. Mary has waited in expectation for this manifestation, waiting for his expected time. And here we see in, in verse number six, it says, this is the NLT version. It says, standing nearby were six stone water jugs used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could bear 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus told them, fill the jars of water when the jars had been filled. And verse 8 says in the NLT version, and he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of the ceremony. So the servants followed his instructions. Can we all stand? And here we see verse 9. The master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. And this is the NLT version. I like how it is explained because it says here he did not realize where it came from. Though the servants who had drawn the water knew where it came from. And this is the important thing because they saved the best wine or they had the best wine first. So the best wine was given to them first. That's what the tradition was. But here we see when he took a sip of that cup, he said, who saved the best wine for last? This shows that it doesn't necessarily matter what you think, but when God has a purpose for you, hallelujah, when God has designed something and he has spoken to something and your situation might go crazy, we see here they lost wine, looking for wine, everything, everybody's going crazy, panicking, panicking, Every, everybody's panicking because this the wedding wouldn't have been good enough if they didn't have no wine. And I'm not talking about being drunk. I'm talking about an occasional whatever was, what was being done here. And I'm not, when, I, when the Bible speaks about wine, we're not speaking about getting drunk. We're not speaking about that. But it's important for us to realize that when this wine was given, this wine was better. This was, wine was, they tasted, the quality was richer than the first one. And they had no idea where this came from. And I just want to submit to you today that expect the transformation of God to be done in your life. Expect what God is doing for you. Expect an expectation and something special. Because when God speaks, when God is doing something, let's just do it in anticipation, with great expectation of what he's going to do. And that's my message to you in Jesus' name.